The lecture today is about psychedelics and plant medicines in oncology care. My name is Dr. Samit Kumar. I'm a psycho-oncologist, which is a psychologist that specializes in working with cancer patients. I've been working with people going through cancer and their caregivers for almost 20 years now, so I've extensive experience seeing thousands and thousands of people going through this illness. Um, my specialties are in end-of-life care specifically and also in bereavement. I'm also delighted to report in the last five or ten years an increasing specialization in cancer survivorship, which is getting better and better every year. About ten years ago, I was involved with MAPS in uh, writing a study protocol to uh, administer psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, to people suffering from terminal cancer. And ever since then, it's been a fairly deep dive into the world of plant-based medicines and healing modalities for people with cancer that may sometimes fall outside of the mainstream. Um, thank you for taking the time to listen to this lecture today. I hope to uh, make it worth your while. So to get started, uh, the topic today is psychedelics and plant medicines in oncology care. When we think about psychedelics, what comes to mind? Usually we think about something from the 1960s, or perhaps if you're younger, a rave experience you may have had. But really when we talk about structured, administered healing modalities that are using chemical agents, what we're really talking about, ironically, is facilitating mystical experiences in oncology care. This brings up a lot of tension and a lot of different issues with, between how the medical establishment views itself, what the scientific mission is, or at least how it's perceived to be, in what has traditionally been the realm of religious and spiritual traditions. For several hundred years now, there's been a disconnect between what's considered spiritual and mystical and what's considered medical. It's unfortunate that it's come to this in the, in the uh, original scientific uh, way of thinking that started in the Renaissance, there was uh, no such disconnect. So perhaps one of the things that can happen from this uh, fusing of psychedelics and plant-based medicines again into medical care is perhaps we can also reunite these two separate um, entities, these two separate ways of healing people together the way they originally used to be. So in order to talk about psychedelics and healing, let's talk about set and setting. Uh, we will focus primarily on cannabis, psilocybin, to a lesser extent on LSD, and also on ayahuasca. I chose to not include MDMA in this talk, primarily because of some technical reasons. One is that MDMA is considered more an intactogen rather than a psychedelic drug. The second is that MDMA research is really thriving in the areas of trauma and PTSD, certainly areas which have a role to play in oncology care, but not the predominant experience that many people have going through cancer. So let's talk a little bit about kind of the background set of all of this. Um, approximately 1.5 million people will be diagnosed with cancer in the U.S. alone this year, and that's roughly the same, although it can seem like it's increasing, it's roughly the same year to year. A cancer diagnosis is, to borrow a definition which I'll get into later, it's a nonspecific amplifier for existential and psychosocial issues in a person's life. We often frequently will like to think of cancer diagnosis being a turning point or a hinge upon which a person's life will change, and many, many times it certainly can be that way. However, what I often experience is that people's psychosocial issues will become amplified, meaning relationships that aren't healthy will fall apart. Uh, relationships that are healthy will draw closer together. Jobs which seemed unsatisfactory won't become more meaningful, uh, generally speaking. And friendships that were really supportive will become more so. So up to 30% of people who are diagnosed with cancer will experience elevated distress, anxiety, depression, and anger at some point in their disease survivorship trajectory. What we're talking about with this 30% isn't the appropriate uh, temporary situational distress that many people get, but really a diagnosable uh, mood disorder kind of situation, be it an adjustment disorder or a major depression or something like that. Around 10% of these people will require assistance with their distress. So what, what is triggered by a cancer diagnosis? The main thing, and these aren't really so much symptoms as they are general experiences that people have, the main thing that people who are diagnosed with a potentially life-threatening or life-limiting illness is uncertainty. Uncertainty meaning not knowing what's going to happen next. We all have an illusion of life being healthy and long and fair, and a cancer diagnosis oftentimes upends this whole illusion. 
it can trigger an involuntary and prolonged stress response in people, which in and of itself can, can become a life-threatening condition independent of where the cancer disease, cancer diagnosis is. Persistent rumination is something that we see quite often. And really what happens sometimes during the course of treatment, hopefully reversible, but sometimes not, is a functional decline that creates an existential vacuum. When a person can't work or be independent or care for themselves in the way they were before, the meaning of their life changes dramatically, often in ways that they're unprepared for. This creates what uh, Joan Halifax uh, coined as an edge state. An edge state is this kind of crisp little thin boundary between the known world and the unknown world. An edge state is something that we experience often, but quite not really as severely as when we're diagnosed with a life-threatening illness. It creates emotional uncertainty, spiritual uncertainty, uh, psychosocial uncertainty, all kinds of uncertainty come up with these edge states as we'll come to find out. So what do we do about these things? Certainly there is no vacuum in terms of healing modalities for cancer patients. The standard therapeutic modalities that we have to offer include cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive existential therapy, and these are really within the realms of psychology. And then we get into music and art therapies, which are outside the box. And they're not quite as incorporated into cancer uh, centers as I would like to see yet, but better every year than the year before. The integrative therapies, such as massage, acupuncture, meditation, and nutrition, which play such a crucial role, not only in cancer treatment, but in cancer survivorship. One of the main questions that I've been asked over the years is, so what can I do differently? And the answers to those questions really fall into the realm of integrative therapies. How do we live our lives better knowing everything that medical science has to offer, but also what the world's wisdom traditions have known for a long time in terms of diet, exercise, and activity level? Also, how do we find joy in our lives again? These are all areas that traditional medicine doesn't really address so much, but that the integrative therapies can. Chaplain support is something that we don't have as much as it should be included. These are professional chaplains who are trained to work with medical populations. They help to restore a sense of spirituality, perhaps encourage some forward thinking, some outside the box thinking. And then we have the psychiatric interventions, which involve primarily medications such as SSRIs or antidepressants, SSNRIs, which affect norepinephrine and different kinds of symptom clusters that can be created by cancer treatment, um, anxiolytics such as benzodiazepines, Xanax, Clonopin, etc. I really discourage people from using these kinds of medications as much as possible. They do carry a lot of significant side effects, but for a lot of people, they are life-changing and uh, they can be helpful. We also have mood stabilizers and psychostimulants that can be used for a lot of people. So do these things work? And in many cases, they're enough. They're, they work very well. Um, there's many people who come in and they, they are very distressed and they say, you know, I want something to treat my distress right away. I don't really want to think too much and too hard about the quality of my life or about the intricate details of my life because it's not that good and there's no hope for change. So, you know, medicate me, dope me up and send me on my way. I'm perfectly good to go like that. Um, there are also certain specific issues that can often come up with people that cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive existential therapy are more than adequate to meet. Um, now, I have to say, though, that there's even though there's a lot of manualized treatments, there's a lot of different experiences that people have depending on the clinician they get. So um, all of these therapies that we're talking about right now are really bound in our culture. And as such, there are culture bound experiences that happen in terms of therapeutic alliance, um, there's a cliched saying that I was trained with that um, your patient can only go as far as the therapist has been in terms of realms of the unconscious or spirituality and personal growth. Um, so there is really kind of a bias that, you know, no two cognitive behavioral therapists are going to work exactly the same way. No two cognitive, ther cognitive behavioral interventions may have the same outcome in different people because there's so much chemistry and individual difference that happens sometimes. Um, there's also culture-bound assumptions on life and death and reality. One of the essential questions to ask people about in uh, their cancer treatment is, you know, are you religious or spiritual? And it's very important to make those distinctions. Um, if you're religious, what do you believe? What do you do? Do you go to church? Is, is that a big part of your life? Um, are you more spiritual? And what does that entail exactly? Do you have a yoga practice? Do you meditate? Do you pray? Um, do you spend time in nature? I mean, there's so many different ways that people experience spirituality 
that they try to amplify the the richness of their lives that it's it's very easy to overlook that in the traditional medical setting and just kind of ignore that and say you know we're going to focus specifically on your disease instead and not going to address these other very rich areas of your life so that's kind of culturally supported again in as scientists we're not supposed to really address these mystical realms these spiritual realms of meaning and, and higher purpose we're supposed to stay focused on problems so once we start getting out of that you know we start getting outside of the comfort zone for where many medical practitioners are so set and setting can not only influence areas of exploration but also non-exploration what are the blank spots and you'll find that sometimes people get very uncomfortable when you start talking about mystical experiences or spirituality in medical settings Oftentimes the patients that I approach about this are overjoyed because they haven't had a chance to really talk to their medical team about this significant part of their lives that they've had a mystical experience or they've had near-death experiences. They have some sort of a, a context for understanding life that's a little bit differently than perhaps their oncologist or perhaps their families are, are used to. It's so rich to explore these areas with people, with comfort and with empathy. So, um, you know, these edge states come up again and again, not just for our patients, but also for ourselves as clinicians. So what is what exactly is effective therapy in oncology care? So, you know, the, the kind of rule of thumb for therapy is you have to meet the patient where they are. But oftentimes, you know, I'm, I'm, you have to kind of address that cliche along with the other cliche, which is what's the definition of, in, of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. So it's not only meeting the patient where they are, but getting them past their comfort zone into the realm of meaningful change. Oftentimes what you find in standard talk therapy is that patients stop showing up once they get outside their comfort zone specifically enough. Now they may say, you know, I went through cancer treatment or I'm, I'm going through cancer treatment or I realize my marriage has been unhappy my job is is not meaningful. Um, I, I need help changing it. I don't like it. Um, you know, I didn't go through cancer treatment for this. And so we'll start talking about the mechanics of change and people will stop coming because it's way outside their comfort zone. They thought they were ready. They're not completely ready. So it's meeting the patient where they are, but also easing them in past their comfort zone into the realm of meaningful change. Effective therapy also involves symptom management. It's really hard to do meaningful work with people on a psychological level um, if they're in, in severe pain, severe prolonged pain. So palliative care um, involves a team approach where you're working with other colleagues who are experienced and trained in symptom management. My work as a psychologist involves pulling together special specialists and specialties from different areas that can affect meaningful change in people's lives and also get their, their symptoms under control. So also establishing meaningful life goals. What is the life that people fight to live? Even if it's not a long life after cancer treatment, even if the cancer can't be treated, um, everybody's going through this for a reason. There's a purpose behind it. And exactly what is that? A lot of times people say, oh, you know, I just like being with my family. Oh, that's nice, but it's not specific enough. So I really try to push specific goals, specific life goals. You know, what do you want to do for these upcoming holidays? Who do you want to be with? Where do you want to spend them? What would you like to eat? As specifically as possible, what is meaningful in your life? Um, good health and long life are wonderful. They're not specific enough. They're not going to get you out of bed. Uh, but if you have something to do, that will get you out of bed. And this is coming from Viktor Frankl's logotherapy perspective, that setting goals um, facilitates meaning. So it's setting these attainable goals that gives us a sense of um, of integrity, of ego integrity. And this is Eric Erickson's uh, last meaningful stages of life is this dichotomy between ego integrity versus despair. What we want to do is avoid despair being the way people approach life's final stages. What we want to do instead is facilitate a sense of meaning and purpose in the Vedic uh, way of looking at things, it's sannyasa, that inward focus. And again, this is more relevant for an end of life setting perhaps than for a young person who's diagnosed with cancer and has a full life ahead of them. So now let's stretch past our own cultural comfort zones and begin our conversation about plant medicines and psychedelics. So unfortunately, the legal status of these um, agents of change it remains uh, very limiting. So drug scheduling logs have never been 
steeped in science. They've never been steeped in, um, in any evidence at all. They're really political decisions. So as such, um, current drug scheduling laws see no therapeutic potential for cannabis, psilocybin, LSD, or DMT, which is the active ingredient found in, well, it's debatable whether it's the active ingredient, but it's one of the principal ingredients of the ayahuasca root. Um, which clearly, this is mistaken. The evidence base suggests otherwise. Decades, if not thousands of years of human experience suggest otherwise, but these are the laws of the land, or at least of the United States for now. So many religions also prohibit intoxication. However, they do rely on spiritual experiences. So, um, you know, meditation and prayer are safe and they're legal, mostly, uh, depending on where you are. Um, culturally, they're somewhat ex more acceptable. But what we find is that there are, especially in, in, um, in Buddhist practice, there's a strict ban on intoxicants, which people interpret loosely. Um, and there's also a strict ban specifically on certain intoxicants like alcohol um, and anything that sort of distorts the pristine awareness of the mind. So psychedelics, and as they're also called entheogens, which facilitate spiritual experiences, fall into a gray area. And uh, I, I don't think that this lecture can answer all the questions, many of them very excellent, justifiable and complex questions about what exactly is an entheogen. Is it compatible with spiritual practice? Is it incompatible with spiritual practice? Um, it's very complicated. Um, once you get into the community of people who are using psychedelics and, and entheogens, you realize that, you know, there are meaningful experiences that happen in concerts and rave settings that otherwise, you know, they're just as life changing as any psychotherapy can be. But, you know, sitting here saying you really should only have them in structured therapeutic settings um, kind of contradicts what a lot of people do experience. And, you know, we, we can't really be naive to that, but we also have to keep in mind that that is very illegal. Um, so really where a lot of people find peace is that to think about psychedelic and entheogenic use in structured therapeutic settings or in ritualized settings rather than casual recreational use. And that's really kind of where we see things going uh, down the line if psychedelics are to be legally accessible is to have healing centers set up that um, that facilitates structured therapeutic encounters with the self, with the sacred, with with meaningful change.